go down to you know, um, the flora and fauna of, of Palestine. And that was important for um, their military attack that later birthed the state of Israel. So Israel was born from surveillance and continues to be a surveillance state par excellence. Um, and, you know, surveillance, whether it be going back to old school ways of, you know, having a web of, an, of, of informants to having military towers to the um, current point in time of having sophisticated uh, uh, spyware or biometric surveillance technologies. I mean, digital surveillance and surveillance in total is uh, indispensable for Israel as a central colonial project where, you know, you, you rely on the categorization of Palestinians in order to control not only the population, but also the territories um, they occupy. And so if you look at, you know, the current situation right now across historical Palestine, but specifically in East Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza, um, and this legal system that is described as a crime of apartheid and a system of apartheid really relies and is dependent on um, Israel's surveillance of Palestinians. And again, the categorization of people they occupy and with it um, access to territory and access to quote unquote rights attached to the legal system um, uh, that they're subject to. And um, in order to uh, maintain that system, of course, Israel has relied on, you know, it continues to innovate its methods in order to ensure that uh, its uh, systems of control and subjugation is fine tuned, is, is, is innovated, um, and, in, and now, as some people describe it, even automated with the use of AI and, and biometric surveillance technologies. And so, for instance, we've seen uh, how certain companies and I think here also I want to, before I share specific examples, if you look at um, the technologies that Israel deploys, whether it be biometric surveillance, and, and by that I mean um, facial recognition technologies, the collection of Palestinians' biometric data uh, in order to have access um, to permits that would allow you to um, uh, cross or move from one point to the other, and particularly if you want to move from the West Bank into into Israel, where the um, the the ident identification or the verification of your identity is uh, is necessary uh, for for your movement. Um, all of that collection and um, uh, and processing of our of our personal information. Uh, including some of the most sensitive and biometric data in general is classified as sensitive information, personal information, because um, different to other types of data. Let's say if your um, if your password, email password gets leaked, you're always able to to change that. But if your biometrics are leaked, tough luck. I mean, some of those are, uh, you know, you remain identifiable by your biometric information, like your fingerprints or ISIS, uh, iris scans, uh, until the point you die. All of that collection and processing happens uh, outside of the realm of any, um, any laws or even ethics um, that regulate the use and the collection of, of this information. And so, you know, going back to Samuel's point, it has created a uh, a very um, rich and, and and fertile ground for experimenting, fine tuning, prototyping all sorts of technologies that again aim at the control and subjugation of Palestinians as an occupied people. Um, one of the examples I wanted to give is the Israeli facial recognition uh, technologies company called AnyVision. They've changed their name recently but this company has been contracted by the israeli ministry of defense in in 2018 and and, and briefly also before that and they have deployed um facial recognition systems at palestinian uh, sorry at israeli military checkpoints used by palestinians and later on if you scroll through if you go to the company's website and look at some of the technologies they sell, whether it be to airports or for border management and control, they again rely on the uh, on this um, stamp that those are field tested or 
you know that those technologies have proven efficient in 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 one of the most uh, challenging security environments, again, referring to the Palestinian territories that Israel occupies. That company makes is one of the most successful companies that sell facial recognition technologies, but it's not only tied to that. There are so many Israeli surveillance companies that were birthed out of Israel's military um, industrial complex where those individuals that have served in the Israeli army and particularly in its uh, elite intelligence, um, military intelligence units uh, called Unit 8200, um, you know, once they've finished their service, um, they go and open shops, their own shops, selling their technologies to customers that, uh, and particularly governments that want it. And that industry, which Israel excels at, is so-called homeland security industry has really exponentially grown after 9-11. So you see that Israel is always postures itself as one of the leading countries and sellers of these technologies, given its experience in a post 9-11 world where governments um, have not only are not only eager to uh, in, um, acquire these sophisticated technologies, but also in, in some instances have bended their own laws to enable the mass surveillance and the interception of people's communications in this digital world. And here, for example, one uh, prominent case that comes uh, to mind is the NSO Group. It's an Israeli company that was established by um, two veteran Israeli army soldiers. Um, and it sells this infinite, infamous and sophisticated spyware, Pegasus spyware, that um, uses um, what you call zero-click attacks, where you know uh, a target's phone can be infected with the spyware and turned into really a surveillance device where the, the, the perpetrator can have access to all of your information your calls, your messages, your contacts, your photos, even your encrypted uh, uh, messaging apps. Um, and uh, the company, if you look at the company, it uh, basically uh, reiterates the claim that uh, it sells its technologies to government clients uh, in order to fight crime and terrorism. And even though the company has been caught red-handed in facilitating human rights abuses around the world, from Saudi Arabia to Azerbaijan, Serbia, um, uh, uh, Morocco, Bahrain, really there's a long list of countries that have used this technology, which by the way, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has also used it as part of his uh, uh, diplomatic efforts to try and help establish diplomatic relations between Israel and other nations have often included, you know, Pegasus spyware and other similar surveillance technologies as part of um, the package um, by which these these uh, governments or nations are rewarded if they strengthen or establish new diplomatic relations with Israel. And so here you see how surveillance is not only an integral part of Israel's occupation, but it's also an integral integral part of its surveillance uh, industry that it that exports to the rest of the world. Um, and you know, and it's very interesting that despite uh, pushback from civil society, investigators, um, media organizations, if you look at the NSO group, it, as I said, it has been caught red-handed, and there has been recent, in over the last maybe couple of years, um, some pushback against the company. For example, the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce added this uh, NSO group and um, two two other Israeli surveillance companies to its entity list, whereby uh, it forbids or bans the ban the invest the investment or um, you know, financial or business interactions between these companies and U.S. companies, which is a great first step. And since then, the, the NSO group has been trying really hard uh, to lift the, these uh, sanctions, if you may. Now, after October 7th, NSO group has come out of the woodwork uh, with, with, an interest, with a very interesting PR move uh, claiming that they are there to help Israel f 
find and locate their hostages inside of Gaza. But that message, and regardless whether their 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 claims are actually from a from a technical point of view are possible or not, because again, how are you going to hack into the devices of um, of uh, hostages that might be uh, held under tunnels where they don't have access to the devices, or if they have taken their devices with them in the first place? But this argument aside. Um, the fact that companies like NSO Group and other cyber surveillance companies see in October 7th and in Israel's current war on Gaza as an opportunity to expand, rehabilitate their image and expand their sale as, um, as, a, as a force for good as companies that can help governments fight terrorism is a very interesting uh, space to, to watch and, and, you know, and reinforces um, the, the reality that Palestine is a laboratory for the um, uh, innovation of these technologies that are later packaged and sold uh, to the outside world, um, right. resulting in further uh, human rights abuses. Right. Thank you so much, Marwa. I think you expanded also your answers, uh, your answer, and also jumped to the to the second question. But it's it's great input, and I think also as you said, um, the like the 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 israeli uh, industry of uh, cyber security and surveillance has to do with um israel colonizing the land and the in infrastructure of palestine and this is exactly what happened also in gaza when all of the internet wi-fi um telephone lines calling the ambulances were just forbidden for everyone so it just like um, a tap that they can open any moment of time to to make us link to the word uh or not israel is also uh colonizing the technological and communication infrastructure um, of Palestine. So we're talking about also not cyber spaces, but also physical, as you said, towers and places. In 2014, uh, the Harb Gaza and Gaza war, Israel has bombed 14 uh, uh, telecommunication spots for Paltel telecommunication uh, groups. So I think all of the telecommunication industry that we have as a, a, a as a as an access to the word is also targeted on the ground and in in the clouds, um, uh, as we say. Samir, uh, back to you. In, in your paper, Making a Killing Israel's Military Innovation Ecosystem and the Globalization of Violence, you were also talking about the engagement of private companies, startups, research institutions, universities, and even banks and venture financing um, institutions and organizations in the Israeli militarization and developing the Israeli militarization. I'm really curious, just like to know more about how private sector and different stakeholders all over the all over uh, the globe are also maintaining this industry and how we should be aware for such an issue as individuals all over the world and also as a Palestinians. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and it's great. And I think um, Marwa also laid a bit of this framework, which is really, really fantastic. She mentioned um, the military industrial complex um, and, and built into that uh, with a focus on the, pro, um, uh, the NSO group, um, which I'll touch upon also in a moment. Um, for me, I, 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 I took from the idea of the military industrial complex, which is something that hasn't uh, really resonated strongly in um, with, with academics in, in management and organization studies, as, as you would know, and instead um, try to reframe this around the idea of um, a military innovation ecosystem, which, which ties to the, uh, a kind of a, a, a large awareness of uh, entrepreneurial innovation and ecosystems, which is always normatively, positively framed, even though um, entrepreneurial innovation has um, has almost always been tied to uh, to military and militarization. So, for instance, Silicon Valley wasn't only just built on um, colonized, uh, settled, colonized land that had been 
um, uh, expropriated from First Nations community, but Silicon Valley grew deeply in conjunction with uh, U.S. military technology, and that is something that's really lost, um, or at least um, um, management and organization scholars very few really look at this. Um, so I, for me, when thinking about the widely promoted idea of Israel as a startup nation, I think about it along the times of Israel's military innovation ecosystem, which includes, as you suggest, the constellation of industries, infrastructures, organizations involved in weapons development, testing and sales, that includes, as Marwa um, alluded to, military uh, state agencies and tech startups, private companies, but also universities, research institutes, as well as banks and venture financing. So this also enrolls actors who aren't conventionally thought of as being involved in weapons development. So they include, for instance, public research funding agencies, so, for instance, those of us in Europe uh, might know that e the EU, through their Horizon 2020 research grants, have, uh, have been known to fund Israeli weapons companies via what's called dual-use technologies, meaning technologies that have both civilian and military application. Um, and so, a, a weapons company with a, a university partner will put in an application for a technology that supposedly will be used for c civilian purposes, but it also has um, some kind of tech uh, or military tech application, often in, in aviation, for instance, such as in drones. Um, the UK also funds research links with UK universities that have links to weapons companies that sell products and also parts to Israel. And there have been some uh, research that suggests that over the last 30 years, upwards of two billion pounds have been allocated to UK universities through uh, UK funded agencies for military related uh, research. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, in fact, because only uh, a couple of dozen universities have been willing to share information through freedom of uh, information requests. Um, and I think it's important to really recognize, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch again, this, the idea of this deep link between universities and military and weapons research, but also what Marwa referred to as this revolving door between military intelligence, especially in particular elite cyber agencies, um, and the entrepreneurship startup scene. So this is something that's been reported widely where people serve in a military tech, uh, cyber warfare tech capacity, and instead they, when they leave that, uh, they go and they work for a startup or they launch their own startup. So there's this real fluidity um, between um, between universities, university research, between the military, but also the entrepreneurship scene, and I think. I think it's important to recognize that this is really uh, a widespread phenomenon. It's, there's, there's a huge number of Israelis that are thought to be actually involved in some form of weapons development and sales. Of course, uh, military service is mandatory for a majority of Israeli civilians, so there is a high militarization within society. But even uh, in the 1980s, there was an article in the New York Times actually by Thomas Friedman, someone I don't uh, quote too often, but in this piece in the 80s, he reported that one in every 10 Israelis who are in Israel's uh, workforce are working in um, something related to a weapons industry. And, th and Israel's um, military industries have uh, grown tenfold since you can imagine that number would have uh, grown. So I think in terms of understanding the role of global capital, um, Marwa mentioned the infamous NSO group, which developed Pegasus and other military grade spyware. But the NSO group actually has been um, backed by investment banks and hedge funds that are based in New York and London. So they've, they've uh, you know, their shares have been sold and the ownership of uh, or part ownership of the group has been sold from 
initially it was a London based group to New York back to London and back and forth so these there's a there is a role of global capital and finance um, involved in backing these in fact one of the reasons the um, the US um, had delisted the NSO group from a restricted sales is that it's th was thought to be um, possibly bought from a, a US weapons manufacturer uh, and US based investment firms that wanted to uh, buy it uh, and use that technology. I'm not, I'm not sure what happened with that deal, but so there's all these deals. So often this tech is really backed by global um, global funds and investment banks that are really these kind of murky uh, organizations that we don't really know how they operate. Uh, they aren't publicly traded. Um, they're not really uh, quite transparent. We don't know who owns uh, who owns them, how and et cetera, where their funds are are being invested. Also interesting is that Israel uh, sells bonds. Right now, Israel has been selling bonds, uh, especially in the U.S. in uh, especially in Republican uh, states. They've been using the opportunity of uh, this war to sell bonds. But since Israel's inception. Um, I think they began selling Israeli bonds in, um, in 1950. Uh, there was possibly an earlier version of that. Um, but these bonds have channeled tens of billions of dollars into st uh, Israeli state activities in, in every sector, from military to transportation to banking and finance, um, and, and also into subsidies to settlements. So it was estimated about four to five years ago that over one to 1.5 billion annually has been um, is channeled in, from Israeli state um, into settlement activity. The this is just Israeli state funds. It doesn't include funds that are coming from um, organizations that support the Zionist um, Zionist settlement in, um, from all over the world. And I think also when we think about the role of uh, private companies, we can't ignore. The increasing role of big tech. So Marwa mentioned AnyVision, which was actually also uh, backed by Microsoft until um, there were massive protests uh, by Microsoft employees and Microsoft decided to pull out of that um, project. But um, the biggest example right now is Project Nimbus, which many of you might have heard about. It's a $1.2 billion US contract between Google and Amazon and the Israeli state. And the contract is to provide AI and cloud computing services to state agencies, including the military, including the police. And the one notable thing uh, and horrific thing about this contract is it offers neither, uh, neither Google nor Amazon any um, permissible oversight into how the technology is being used, even in the case of war crimes or other human rights abuses. Um, there's also a clause that they, they can't pull out of this contract. And so I'll maybe mention it a little bit later and how people are reacting to this. But it's important to know that also some of the world's largest companies like Google and Amazon, it's estimated that 50% of the population in the world use Google services at least once a week, mainly Google search, um, but also cloud services. Uh, Amazon operates in over 180 countries, and it's one of the largest uh, providers of cloud services globally. Of course, Amazon does many other things. And so these are companies that touch the lives of um, billions of people uh, in the world. And in some way, it ties all of us together, um, you know, whether we like it or not, into um, this kind of global um, innovation ecosystem um, that that supports Israel's uh, military and violence and ultimately uh, the subjugation of our people. Right, thank you so much, uh, Samir. I was also reading about um, the, the, the speed of the development of the Israeli militarization in industry. Um, yes, it's not maybe like number one or number two uh, of its uh, military expenditure, but according to Stockholm International Peace Research, Institute, um, Israel um, has the second higher percentage of um, military expenditures per capita, per capita, which is $2,500 per capita after Qatar. 
it's exactly what you're um, speaking about and how horrifying this and how easy is it to spread um, guns, uh, especially in between Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Uh, we do remember that after the 7th of October, um, guns were just like given for Israeli settlers within with a green, with a green, uh, um, with just like a, a blanche card of, of of shooting any any Palestinians who whosoever whosoever because we are we are in in war. Uh, back to you, Marwa. I think you you started speaking about this, but I'm also wondering exactly as Samir said, uh, Nimbus and the 1.2 billion dollar investment with big companies like Amazon and Google. Everyone uses these these companies. Why do you think these companies could 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 just like um, be in collaboration with Israel? Why it has been researched, published, and spoken about by not only activists, researchers as well? How this industry is oppressing the Palestinians? Why such companies like Amazon and Google do you think and other big companies would be uh, aligned in such oppressing projects of surveying Palestinians, killing them as well, and oppressing them on a daily basis? I mean, they are profitable companies. They're making good. And if we're speaking in, a, in an economic marketing sense, why would they be involved in Nimbus or other um you know, Israeli kind of collaborations and businesses. Um, thank you, Amal. Before I answer your question, your the statistics you gave reminded me of another illuminating uh, statistic that Israel has the um, highest number of surveillance companies per capita in the world. So adding also to Israel's edge of um, uh, being the world's uh, top exporter of uh, of uh, not only weapons, but also surveillance tech. To your question, um, really, it's a simple answer. It's profit. There are only few uh, companies that you count on one hand, known as the, the big tech. And those companies have had saturated markets um, in the US, in Europe, and have been looking into expanding their services outside, um, particularly in, in our region. As a matter of fact, we have been campaigning against Google's cloud region expansion um, in Saudi Arabia, another country with the, with the dismal human rights record. It's another surveillance state. And building a cloud region in a country like that, where simply the employees of, of that company can be held at gun to hand uh, personal data to the authorities if they deem necessary is an extremely problematic uh, proposal. And I think, you know, I, I really look at uh, Google and Amazon's expansion in that perspective. I have been in endless conversations with them, private and public, as to why they have made decisions against at least what they claim to be uh, a commitment to uh, respecting human rights per the UN guiding principles on business, on business and human rights, a set of, of, um, of rules, if you may, uh, that uh, came into being in 2011, um, that outline businesses responsibility to address and mitigate human rights risks associated with the use of their uh, policies of their services and products. And so, I think for Google and Amazon, they see Israel as a lucrative market. Israel does pride itself in being a startup nation. And I think for these Western companies, they see they do see Israel as a state of, of uh, tech unicorns. Uh, so it is profitable business for them. Um, and tied to that is the fact that these companies have been operating, again, outside of the realm of accountability. You know, if you um, if you ask if and I have we have done so, you know, if you ask a company like Google, okay, you as a company claim that you are abiding by the UN guiding principles on business human rights, you're taking your human rights responsibilities uh, seriously, you do conduct human rights due diligence before you expand into new markets or sign con business contracts with problematic 
uh, governments and regimes like the Israeli regime, like the Saudi regime? How can you green light such a proposal? And here you get into um, the very tricky uh, business speak of, well, we've done our human rights due diligence uh, and our findings uh, do assure us that we have a certain level of confidence that our business, uh, that our services will not end up being um, used for the, the perpetration of human rights abuses or war crimes in the case of Israel. If you ask the company, where are your, find, your, your, your human rights due diligence findings, th this is where you basically hit a wall in terms of um, holding these companies accountable. And so, you know, to Samir's point, we have been trying to take the, you know, deconstruct this monster of surveillance. So who are the, the actors that build this, this monster together from investors, to the companies that provide these services, to the to the governments that use these services, and make sure that each of those actors are held accountable. And so there's been investor advocacy, you know, shareholder resolutions being filed, a lot of pressure on uh, on companies like Google and Amazon to um, even demonstrate to their own shareholders um, how these these uh, services are not ending up in human rights violations and like here you hit another wall of the corporate structure and shareholders uh, power of um, you know as a shareholder how much voting power do you have and you can simply strike down um, some of those uh, attempts to hold the companies accountable so you know to to summarize i think sadly it is really profit and for these companies they don't see israel as we see it as a region in occupation uh, as a military occupation as an apartheid regime as a etc colonial power whose purpose is to subjugate palestinians um and uh, to unleash all sorts of violence against them um they see it as a lucrative business contract and then you know from that perspective i think looking at it from um um you know from a from a point of power of how can we actually challenge challenge these existing structures of oppression um we we have a long way to go and you know a lot of tech employees at these companies have also been campaigning for years now in order to hold the company accountable so there is pressure from multiple fronts to what extent can google and amazon maintain the you know the the their stubbornness and maintain their position that they can go ahead with such business deals i think time will tell but also history has shown us that um businesses can go as far as we can let them you know be um and we sh we should continue interrogating uh their business deals until really they become as radioactive as blood diamonds so some businesses should not go ahead as uh, as they do now and that of course will will depend on how much pressure and uh, collective activism we do to ensure that um you know th these these deals are stigmatized as they should be yeah you're absolutely right uh, marwa you might you reminded me of the documentary the great hack and how Cambridge Analytica just closed out of the uh, out of what happened uh, in between the Great Hack, the name of the documentary, uh, after, and um, at the end Cambridge uh, Analytica has just uh, closed. So this was the company in Britain that worked uh, aligned uh, between uh, Trump uh, political uh, party and marketing political party and, and 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 Facebook while stealing, I think, almost. 80 million Facebook data, uh, 80 million uh, uh, look, Facebook data of an 80 million uh, Americans. Um, and you're right regarding these uh, companies. Uh, I've also given a lot of cases about uh, Amazon and the the humiliation that the employees have in Amazon. If you go to YouTube and you just write an X amazon employee, you can hear horrific stories about how the employees are treated. Uh, if they haven't packaged a parcel within a couple of seconds, they will be fired. They have no time to eat. They have no time to go to the toilet because they're, wor they're working in massive warehouses. 
So I think these uh, uh, these companies also, as you said, do not care about basic human rights. So how come also they will care about other uh, human rights, such as Palestinians and the rights to be liberated and and, and live in full in, in full dignity? Um, I think like my final question for both of you, Samir and and and, and Marwa, um, is about what we can do as 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 individuals, uh, how we can uh, how we can fight, how we can resist, how we can bring more awareness. Can we boycott? How can we collect uh, these these efforts? Mobilize forward. Uh, when I think Marwa about social me media platforms, it is as you said, it's a very oppressing hegemonic structures that we are daily usually uh, use. And I always have this question in mind, can we fight and resist from within? Can we fight Facebook from within Facebook? Can we fight, I don't know, Instagram and YouTube? I shared also um, a, a study that I did about YouTube and how YouTube also violated the Palestinian uh, content uh, while targeting Palestinian videos and allowing other pro-Israeli videos to go online uh, on YouTube. So my question, maybe for for both of you, just to end up with the with this question and then go ahead with the with the uh, with the audience uh, question, if they have any, what we can, what we can, what we can do. These are two big businesses. We know that heavy investments, billions, billions, billions of dollars engagement with biz, with biz, with big companies we don't we, we don't want to spread this this feeling of fear at uh, at all that we are you know surveilled all all the time and they are um, a very fast moving industries of militarization and cybersecurity yes this is the, re the the reality and that's why we're conducting we're conducting this webinar and speak further about this but definitely as you finished your uh, your part Marwa, there's something to be to be done so what can you tell regarding this summer? Marwa, do you want to, before I want? continue, you have a hand. Would you like to um, continue? No, I just wanted to um, add a point about uh, Google that I forgot to mention that, you know, going back to the point about their business expansion. In one of uh, the conversations with uh, Google with regards to um, their cloud region expansion in Saudi Arabia, they were very blunt to us about the fact that if they didn't take that contract, some other company will. So I, I also think that they apply the same logic to their project Nimbus in, in Israel. It's a, it's a lucrative $1 billion contract. And I think for them, you know, if they didn't go ahead with that, then who are the other businesses that provide similar, you know, you have in this case, Microsoft. So I think they see it among themselves that it's either or it's either us or it's someone, some other business will take that. Uh, well, they will take that contract. So just to, to emphasize on the point that it is at the end of the day, a matter of, of profit, but Samet, I, um, I, I hand it back to you on uh, solutions. <laughs> solutions. Um, Thanks, Marwa. I, uh, I'll just build before I um, actually go on and respond to the question, Amal, because I think Marwa, you know, this question about, um, you know, she she mentioned a, a few things, one of them about the contract and it's, it's not just, it's not just the $1.2 billion, it's, uh, oh, you know, once the, the actual infrastructure is built, uh, there There will be future contracts in order to maintain it. But also Google and Amazon, um, from, from my reading and, and, and other conversations with Google and Amazon activists, is that the company is really looking to position itself and learn from these contracts because there's, there's a, a, a learning the same way that Israel has developed its kind of industries and strategies, as Marwa really said about around cyber, cyber security and cyber warfare, or, or around the occupation. Um, Google and Amazon will learn from this contract and position itself as a, a kind of a, an industry expert or leader for future contracts. And the market for AI and cloud-supported um, military uh, service contracts is set to grow uh, exponentially 
over the coming decades. And it's, it's in traditional markets such as the US and around uh, border fortification uh, and also around EU and Fortress Europe, but also with the growing militarization of the region with the Gulf, uh, with the Gulf states. Um, and also when you look at traditional, the traditional big players in terms of weapons um, uh, purchases, uh, India and Pakistan uh, being t two of the largest um, purchases. So, you know, for Google and Amazon to not engage in this particular contract is to uh, forego the potential for um, future contracts uh, moving forward decades. That said, and I think Marwa also talked about the um, governing uh, the global principles on business and human rights, there are really three main ways uh, for regulating business, uh, sorry, for, for keeping business in, in, in intact. And the broad ways for those of us who kind of, uh, you know, look at corporate responsibility or, or ethics, there's, there's regulation, um, there are voluntary standards, and the global principles are really a set of voluntary standards. And then there's uh, activism and labor movements. And those are the three kind of traditional um, ways. And unfortunately, the regulation are, as Marwa mentioned, are quite lacking. The voluntary standards really lack efficacy um, and bite. Um, and usually the voluntary standards are developed by industry players together because we can look at Google and Amazon, but it's not necessarily um, just individual companies. Like we can't just look at the NSO group because these are industry-wide effects. And usually, like in fossil fuels or in mining or um, or in weapons industries, the, it's never really just about the effect of one company, but these are industry level effects. So we really need to think about ways and mechanisms of um, focusing on industries. And, and this is why labor movements are really important, but also uh, regulation, I think, is really uh, of utmost urgency. That said, um, what can we do? Well, what, one of the biggest ones is really responding to the call by Palestinian civil society for an arms embargo. And we're watching unions and workers taking action all over the world. So we spoke about Project Nimbus and, and there is, there is um, uh, quite a, a big and lively no tech for apartheid campaign where thousands of Google and Amazon employees are engaging in. Uh, as Marwa mentioned, this involved in um, shareholder resolutions and other protests. But also, it's important with these actions to remind the company that it's not just about profit. In fact, one of the biggest uh, risks for companies like Google and Amazon, because there are a handful of big players, is employee retention. And so it's estimated, for instance, that Amazon loses hundreds of millions uh, a year in employee turnover, hiring and retraining. And so given Google and Amazon are global and they have employees in, in many countries where there's a lot of sympathy towards Palestinians, I think that needs to be leveraged as well um, um, and to actually help um, articulate uh, the, the, the cost of this sort of business as, um, as well. Um, other forms of more uh, direct action are um, workers refusing to load weapons at ports uh, or groups like Palestine Action targeting factories and offices tied to Israeli weapons manufacturer Elbit Systems. In terms of universities, which I can speak to a bit uh, more readily, across the West we are seeing, and we've seen for years, but uh, a renewed focus on divestment campaigns targeting funds that universities have invested in companies that profit from occupation or violence. So often this is through university pension funds. These campaigns are also targeting military-related links, including research links with weapons companies um, and that I've alluded to uh, earlier. And most of these initiatives are, are being led by Palestinian solidarity student groups who are seeking to hold their own universities accountable to university sustainab sustainability and human rights policies, and also uh, the precedent of divestment from Russian companies after the Ukraine war. Uh, one of the things that I think really requires new energy and new thinking is the academic boycott of Israeli institutions modeled after that the academic boycott against South Africa 
Um, this is something that really hasn't uh, had many wins or, or strongly picked up, especially in the West. And I think it's really uh, integral because so many links with Israeli institutions and weapons companies um, are also quite hidden. So where a divestment campaign will, will target known investments and known links, um, what's really important about academic boycott and having institutions uh, engage in the boycott is that a lot of these links to Israel and weapons companies are actually quite hidden. They're intentionally obfuscated. So for instance, an academic colleague of mine who's based in uh, one of the largest engineering faculties in the UK uh, told me that um, from his uh, kind of awareness, in some engineering faculties, upwards of a third of research has some link to weapons firms uh, or weapons companies, and many of them with links to Israeli institutions. And so the academic boycott and, and blanket academic boycotts, I think, are things that we need to strategize more around. In terms of our research and teaching, I think there's a lot more work to be done, as Marwa was speaking about this sort of mapping, uh, to uncover um, military links within these uh, ecosystems of, of companies and uh, research institutions and investment bankers, who are the actors, who are the stakeholders, etc., and how they relate to questions of business innovation and human rights violations, exactly the work that Marwa was speaking to. And I think, uh, but I think even more urgent, and especially those of us in the West, we really must continue to challenge the silencing within our academic institutions over Palestine-related speech, which has been really, um, and for me it's been really disappointing over the past two and a half months to see just how many scholars in my own field who have a lot to say about pressing societal issues who've remained absolutely silent, not just about the genocide in Gaza, but about the academic, uh, or the repression of academic freedom within their own institutions and nations. And just a last point, and it's a little bit kind of unrelated, but Marwa mentioned uh, blood diamonds and the Kimberley process, etc. Um, before Israel's weapons industry kind of exploded, uh, to use a, a kind of a horrific um, pun, its largest industry and still one that adds uh, at least a billion annually to its economy is cut, uh, cutting and polishing diamonds, so blood diamonds. Um, and that has, uh, and the accessing diamonds, um, many of which come from um, African and, and Asian mines, have also been deeply tied to its weapons strategy uh, on the continent. And so um, these industries are really uh, deeply linked to one another as well. It's not just about weapons, but it's also about um, diamonds, it's also about um, other industries. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, thank you so much, Samir. And I do agree with you. I think um, there's a lot of scholars and researchers, uh, maybe not a lot, that have been extensively write about Palestine. It, it, it looks like also Palestine, it's not only maybe a field for uh, militarization and cybersecurity, but also a field for research and um, a topic to write about, but not fully maybe support in dark times. So I think also this war, as we, we, we once discussed, has uh, revealed um, a lot of friends, um, allies, and supportive people, and uh, other 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 truths um, uh, as well. Uh, Marwa, what can you what, what can you also uh, tell us more about how we can? Although I think it might be uh, hard while using social media, uh, maybe not the people that they are aware of how social media is working while um, uh, surveying Palestinians. I do remember once in Palestine, I don't know if this is uh, if this is true, but there were, there there's one one of these games that can anticipate your age when you are 60 or just like go back in time when you are 10 years old. And there were just like some, some, um, some news from people and citizen journalists that don't use this application because this has to do with Israel uh, face recognition and the cybersecurity of, of Israel to, enter, to, to collect more data, bio data about, uh, about Palestinians. So how can we bring more awareness? What can we do as individuals that we heavily rely on these social media platforms, Amazon, Google, and 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 and, and so on. 
I don't know about this application you shared, but uh, I, I think as a <laughs> as a general rule of thumb, uh, as avid all of us are avid users of of the internet, of smartphones, and all sorts of mobile, you know, smart devices, is that we should always, always be mindful of the digital footprints we leave behind. And I think for Palestinians, this is especially true when. Uh, when Israel relies more and more on the apps to uh, offer quote unquote services to Palestinians. And here comes to mind uh, uh, the Munasak app, the, the coordinator, what is, if, if I can you know translate that to, to English. I was really stunned when I, when I went back home um, this year in August to see how everything has become at checkpoints automated, even obtaining a permit to cross a checkpoint uh, into into Israel. Um, it all requires you um, downloading the application and applying online to that service, which is something that has started in COVID-19. When you, um, when you uh, do a forensic investigation of the app or even read the policy, the privacy policy of the app, you'll be not surprised to know that it has a lot of access to your personal information. Um, we've looked at it in 2021 and back then it did clearly say that it grants, you know, by downloading and using the app, you grant permission to the Israeli authorities to have access to data that they don't need for, for um, the application either to run or to process your, your information to obtain, uh, to obtain a permit. So it is a surveillance tool. It's not it's not spyware. It doesn't download uh, malware or spyware on your device, but it does grant the Israeli authorities uh, an intrusive access to your personal information. So please, please, before you download any applications, understand who is the developer, um, the purpose of of these applications, and what you're giving up in exchange for um, using these services. But I have to say. You know, most of the time, and as much as we want to be tech savvy um, users that really take serious um, steps to ensure that we have a digital hygiene, we're again battling against a a much stronger, more sophisticated surveillance industry. You know, and I can tell you, for example, and not to scare anyone, but no matter how many precautions I have as a digital rights activist. It does not um, it does not prevent my the hacking of my device by Pegasus spyware. It's just a fact, you know, there's um there's always this um fight or competition, if you may, between governments and private businesses that develop and use these sophisticated spyware tools and between digital security experts that invent ways where we can protect ourselves. So this leads me to my second point that, Yes, the owner. Yes, the there is a responsibility for us as users to ensure that we are taking care of ourselves and the security of ourselves and our devices. But I think the onus here is on governments and businesses, on governments as the duty bearers. After all, um, they they are the ones that should be held accountable, and in that case, Israel should be held accountable. And I know there's a lot of attempts at multiple levels to ensure that Israel is held accountable for its war crimes. Uh, and serial human rights abuses. But, you know, I think Samet has uh, provided a very um, nice layout for me to also add and build up on some of the points he uh, he mentioned vis-a-vis -vis how companies conduct themselves. And I think one important point, and I will re-emphasize, especially as we're speaking to scholars and researchers, is that our biggest, our first step to take down this Conglomerate is uh, research and exposure. I cannot tell you how it how important it is to build a case if we, as researchers, as lawyers, as activists, to put facts on paper. Because sometimes I think for us Palestinians, things are maybe a bit obvious. We have been living under surveillance. We know that Israel is a surveillance state. We know that social media companies are silen silencing us. But when you sit down with the companies or with outside um, actors, those acts of oppression are not as clear as we think they are. 
And, uh, you know, just to give you a concrete example, when I started working on content moderation issues in 2015, um, I think up until 2021, company like Meta has always and continues to dismiss their censorship of Palestinian voices as a technical issue. This point in time, when I speak to the company or to other researchers or even to UN, um, to the UN human rights body, for example, there is almost a consensus that this censorship is systematic and deliberate. Um, it took us years to document and provide a well-built evidence case that we're not talking about technical glitches. We're not talking about um, you know, some anecdotal evidence. Here is the here is the case. Now you as a company need to prove to us that you are really doing what is necessary to respect our rights as Palestinian users. So we put the onus back on them to prove what they are doing um, uh, to end their censorship and not vice versa, where we as Palestinians have to always showcase and always prove that we're being censored and we're being oppressed online and offline. So exposure and, and research is, is very important. The second point on, um, on regulation to uh, Sam's point. So indeed, you know, you cannot fight just companies one at a time, although we can of course do that. But I, I, I think that we need to put effort into reining in some of those um, uh, industries that re really operate either in, in the shadows and full secrecy, like the surveillance industry, and also outside of the realm of any international accountability. Um, and so, for example, for years now, we have been uh, calling for a moratorium on the sale and uh, use and transfer of surveillance technologies worldwide. And now we are specifically calling for sanctioning um, spyware or certain surveillance technologies that are inherently incompatible with human rights. For example, you cannot use spyware like Pegasus in a way that can help law enforcement. So let's say in, a, in an ideal utopian scenario where a, democ a democracy is using the spyware uh, to, fight, to find a criminal or to foil a terrorist uh, plot, there is no way that you can use a spyware like Pegasus that is so invasive um, without infringing on people's rights. And so these, these technologies need to be banned. And there, I, maybe another ask from researchers, and especially those who have who work on um, international uh, treaty uh, treaties, for example, on um, the, the arms industry, for the arms industry, for weapons, uh, for any of the other, let's say, industries that went on unaccountable for a long time, but they were reined in with international regulations. What are the the norms that we need to advance and push. Because again, we're talking about indus new industries and the norms and the regulation, you know, technologies are fast, but regulation is really slow. And I think here there is um, there is some things to learn from other industries. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel necessarily. So analyzing and understanding how we can apply some of those norms that have been in advanced to regulate some uh, industries and apply it to um to surveillance industry and particularly this the Israeli surveillance industry is, is one key uh, aspect here and finally I do want to mention um around uh one point around labor labor uh movements and uh and you know I, to your question can we change things from within Yes, if you have uh, tech workers that are willing to blow the whistle on some of the egregious practices by the companies, when tech workers refuse to lend their expertise um, uh, to these companies, if they know that they are basically helping um, war crimes or uh, you know uh, apartheid regimes like Israel to perpetrate atrocious crimes, they do have a role to play. They have a responsibility. And luckily we have this nucleus of um, uh, tech workers that understand um, the linkages between Israeli apartheid and the companies they work in. And I think as, as Palestinians, scholars, activists, wherever, whatever role we occupy, to build uh, connections and bridges with these movements and uh, and cement them further. So 
there are so much actually there's so much to do on that front um it's it's uh, that industry might be yeah as i said like secretive and and scary on an individual level but actually they there's uh, they give us a lot of um work to do um as as scholars and as activists to change this this industry and uh, also to ensure that we have safe spaces for us to have these types of conversations uh, to talk to our friends and families as safely and securely as possible to access information to express ourselves uh, without fear of uh, of surveillance and prosecution, it's it's really important um, for us and also for future generations. Yes, absolutely right, Marwa. Uh, we need these uh, spaces, exactly the ones that we have at the moment, that we can meet um, face to face, but still we can create these virtual uh, spaces to communicate and. Uh, to support each other um, in solidarity. Um, I don't know, Samer, do you, do you have anything else to add? Uh, there isn't that much, there isn't that much of, of questions. I think uh, uh, Ru'a, a friend that I know, she poses a question, I, but I told her that you were answering the questions because she was asking about what we can do as individuals in this regard. And I think you fully answered um, this question. I don't know if I missed any of the questions, but many, Thank you so much for sharing because uh, many are sharing like some very important, uh, very important links. But if there's any question from the audience, uh, feel free to raise your hand or just to pose your question. I think there was one question, but I missed it first. Um, I think it was for you, Sam, but let me check. Yeah, uh, from Sunil Kumar. Uh, this was for Marwa, actually. What are the likely explanations of the failure of the failure of the digital technology leading up to the seventh of October? So, I love this question. <laughs> it's a uh, well, we we have seen in the last few years and i think also again israel uh comes at the top of the list of over reliance of governments on on tech companies for all sorts of things and it's um it's an interesting market because i'm not an economist but uh in just basic economy you know the basic economy there is a high demand and a high supply there are companies that promise um quite a lot and sell a lot of snake oil to, to governments and uh, that, you know, these technologies are important for as again, you know, like if you look at the claims of, of NSO group and others that these are essential tools that would enable governments to fo foil terrorist attacks, to um, crack down on, on criminal rings. Uh, and so if you look at how Israel has really relied quite significantly on those types of uh, surveillance technologies, whether it be uh, on unmanned ground vehicles, um, aerial unmanned aerial vehicles, um, and all kinds of technologies that they have deployed along the the border, which ironically, I think a week before they've take they've uh, they the Israeli uh, authority took um, the chairman of uh, uh, of uh, of NATO's uh, military committee uh, to like on a tour to the Gaza border to showcase Israel's military and surveillance technology at work, only to be breached a week after uh, by Hamas. I think, in a way, um, that attack has really put. The, this claim under the the microscope, not even under a microscope. I'd actually put it under question of um, scrutinizing this this claim and the pretext used again and again by national security or by governments that these tools are important for national security. A, they are not. B, they do, um, and you know they do um, end up violating people's rights, uh, which you know is not necessarily considered as part of government's uh, calculation of what national security is. But it, it is really a wake up call. And, um, and I think that's why some of the Israeli cyber uh, companies like NSO Group and others 
are trying really hard to in post October 7th to rehabilitate er their image and make themselves relevant. But I am not sure how far they can demonstrate uh, that given indeed the 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 conclusion that these technologies can no matter how fancy they they sound they really have a um you know serious limitations to what they can achieve thank you Marwa. i think uh, sunel if i pronounce that right you also raise your hand do you want to pose a question thank thank you amal and uh, marwa and uh, samir uh, I just wanted to follow up, uh, Marwa, from your initial analysis, I think, which is absolutely, absolutely spot on about the digital occupation. And I'm just trying to still understand that on one hand, there is this massive surveillance of Palestinians, right? And the other hand, there's this massive failure, 100% failure of the technology of surveillance. And I'm trying to see how that can be reconciled. Um, I mean, I think that you can one can talk about failures in parts of the surveillance system and so on and so forth, but it seems like a that that hundred percent failure. And and I just wondered, therefore, how one could try and make sense of this this kind of um, the 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 level to which digital occupation occupation is used, the way in which surveil Palestinians are surveilled and they're controlled and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you have this complete failure. So I'm, I'm just trying to, in my mind, trying to reconcile those two. I think there is a, thank you, uh, Sunel, for this question. I think there is a, one factor that we haven't discussed, and that is Palestinians' resistance to surveillance, which renders these technologies ineffective. I, you know, when we talk about uh, Israel's digital occupation, um, to put it more concretely, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, the cables that connect Gaza with the rest of the world, for instance, they all run through Israel. Um, Israel also, you know, controls um, electromagnetic uh, frequencies that are given to Palestinian mobile network operators. Um, they have pretty much since 2007 controlled every piece of equipment that goes into the Gaza Strip and they have rejected um, the upgrade of, of Palestinian telecommunications operators um, technologies as, under the allegation or you know undisclosed uh, allegations uh, for dual use so technologies that can be used for civilian and military purposes have been uh, denied access to the Gaza Strip and as a result of that the people in Gaza rely on 2G networks now, not only these are extremely slow uh, mobile connections, they are very unsafe. They don't support the, the, the latest encryption communications. They're easy to intercept. And as a matter of fact, um, some countries downgrade, intentionally downgrade mobile networks to 2G, as Iran does, for instance, in order to facilitate easier interception of communications. So if you look at yeah the Israeli if you look at people in Gaza and the way they stay the current status quo before October 7th all of their communications not only are controlled by Israel given how now we see for instance Israel kills the switch where, wherever it uh, whenever it wants um cutting the Gaza strip completely off uh, communications and cutting it off from the rest of the world but the entire population that uses mobile networks can be easily intercepted. Now, here is the question of what um, tools have been developed in order for uh, Palestinians to, or at least some group of Palestinians, to go under the radar of these uh, technologies. Um, and sometimes it's very interesting that in order to resist or combat the highest edge technology, you go back to the oldest methods of and the oldest tools of communications. In, in the case of, uh, I think for Hamas, they were relying on hardware, hardwired uh, telephones, or at least a hardwired uh, manufactured communication system that they had that they, Israel could not easily intercept. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that is one of the factors that can reconcile the, the two contradictory facts together, that Yes, Israel relies on on 
high-tech surveillance technology, extremely invasive. At the same time, they we as we've seen in October 7th, they could result in serious uh, breaches. Um, and I also, again, I don't want to paint things as black and white because that's also dangerous, um, even for our own security, because you can't say, well, these technologies are all ineffective or say, well, they're too strong and not to be combated. But um, it's it's really somewhere in between. Um, and Hamas, of course, is not the rest of the Palestinian population where, you know, you, you, you can't develop your own communication system if you're talking to your family and friends and uh, using your smartphone for everyday communication. So there, yeah, there is different shades of gray, if you may. But I hope this answers your question. If I may just uh, also add, I mean, to that, um, just a minor point, Sunil, that of course this notion of it, this widely propagated notion of Israel as a startup nation is, is it's a narrative and it's based on the promise of what Israel's uh, technological and its military uh, proficiency can deliver and can do. And of course, with any technology, especially around surveillance, it's about data. data. And data is only as, um, uh, as, as powerful as its tools of interpretation. And so um, uh, really there's always a kind of uh, gaps between the, the way in which um, narratives especially get associated with with uh, new technologies and what they promise and and also what they deliver and I think with Israel one of the things um, one of the things in and around uh, October 7 is that it it really showed a, a kind of um, um, a disruption uh, at least uh, momentarily a disruption in in the this kind of um, idea of uh, of its uh, surveillance state and the the efficacy of the, of the surveillance state now that said i think in in this kind of unhinged uh, genocidal uh, bombardment of gaza and the discussion even even the critical discussion around the use of ai tools to generate targets and and things like that in this kind of death factory um, that's been discussed about all also embedded in that critique is uh, a kind of a showcase of its if it's new tech so in some ways uh, in, in addition to the disruption I think those who are in the position of purchasing and these uh, these orders are often made um, you know they year years out for, for future orders and whatnot, the question of whether or not October 7 will, will really disrupt um, the actual sales and investment in these new types of technologies, I think um, it's up in the air, it's uncertain. I'm not sure that it's likely to disrupt that because I do think that those who have influence in governments and security intelligence agencies globally, in police forces, in border security, forces in militaries globally that are already um, bought and sold on the Israeli narrative or come from states that actually use weapons sales as a means to support uh, Israel and sh show their solidarity with Israel. We see Germany, for instance, upping um, its, its arms uh, purchases um, uh, and arms, arms deals, uh, as is Canada and, and, and other places. With Israel, I mean, it, that's I think the the big question. But that is one other area that I think uh, needs a little bit more, or could use a little bit more at, uh, attention, is how um, how these kind of narratives and understanding of of technology can be uh, disrupted as well. It's um, Yeah, thank you so much, Marwa um, and Samir. I think, yes, we are resisting um, all of this uh, dominant uh, structures of uh, of oppressing. For example, um, a master student of mine is um, in her master's, uh, I think she's one of the attendings now, Dana Hassan, she's looking how uh, during Sheikh Jarrah, Palestinians have created new digital forms of resisting the platform of Instagram, 
while taking uh, their uh, reels and stories in different um, positions. So Instagram wouldn't spot exactly that they are speaking politics and all of these, uh, what, what she called it as digital tactics of resistance uh, was uh, was also circulated in between different Palestinian, Palestinian, Palestinian activists. But I think you're right, speaking about Israeli uh, industries of surveillance has also um, is also important also to speak about how Palestinians are resisting uh, digitally uh, as much as uh, on the ground. Um, is there any question? Um, I think all of what I see are compliments and uh, points and just like the audience sharing how much they enjoyed the, the webinar, which is great. So no questions. Oh yeah, great. Thank you so much again. I think this was very fruitful, uh, important. Um, at least we saw each other, we spoke, uh, we shared what we have together. I will be sending all of the mailing lists, um, the video of this webinar and all of the different references, articles and in books, if any of this was uh, was shared. But I think for now we will just like end this this webinar. Uh, I hope everyone will stay safe and good and hopefully uh, we can stay in touch. Um, I don't know, in different webinars uh, or different occasions. Thank you so much, Samir and Marwa again for your time and for the audience. And salam. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, thank you, Amal and Marwa and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>